Over at the end, I'd like to welcome. Good afternoon. Driven by robots, what will the future of mobility look like? My name is Jeff Schneider. I'm a professor at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, uh, where I specialize in artificial intelligence and robotics. Uh, I also was one of the folks that took a sabbatical to help Uber start its self-driving car program six years ago. Um, I would like to introduce our distinguished panel members here. Uh, we have Dmitry Gorskov, uh, the Deputy Head for Control of Information Systems and Resources and Applications and Development with the Moscow Traffic Control Center. We have Greg Lindsay, the Director of Applied Research at the New Cities Foundation. We also have Alexander Palikov, Director of Research and Development at the Institute for Urban Transportation, the Moss Trans Project. Uh, he is the Vice President of UITP and Chairman of the Eurasian UITP Division. We have Kirill Zarinardarov, Head of Transport Infrastructure Projects, the Skolkovo Foundation. And finally, we have Kirsten Heineke, a partner at McKinsey & Company uh, at the Center for the Future of Urban Mobility. We know that uh, vehicles uh, transformed transportation at the beginning of the last century. And we've heard at this forum all the progress that's been made towards making transportation better in our cities and all the things that are being worked on currently. We're now looking farther ahead than that. We know that in China already, Baidu and others have used small autonomous vehicles uh, to transport goods during the pandemic and do sanitization in the streets. We also know that many companies, uh, 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 Kitty Hawk, uh, Joby, uh, Lilium, are working on air transport. So this session is really about the, the future. And now, to get us in the mood for this, uh, I thought I would just show some things from, uh, from Pittsburgh. And so here, this is our little test city uh, for autonomous vehicles. And so you see in this city, uh, in this particular video, all the vehicles will have no driver. They're all driving themselves across the, uh, across the whole, uh, whole video. So it's not an accident that we're seeing this in Pittsburgh as much of the work on autonomous vehicles started in Pittsburgh at Carnegie Mellon going back to the 1980s. Um, and so we see the potential here uh, for vehicles uh, to, uh, to uh, make the process more, more efficient and also more safe. Uh, you will see in this video the, the things that are done to, uh, to test the cars here we have the, uh, the pedestrian coming out, and you see the, uh, the car reacting to it. We also have bikes, many other things here that we test. And so that gets to the, one of the reasons we want to do this. It turns out that worldwide, 3,700 people will die every single day on the roads. Almost all of these are due to driver error. To put that in context, 150 people are going to die just in the time it takes us to have this discussion for this session. It's a very sobering thought. There are other opportunities as well, though. We know that we spend a lot of time and money on the road. Often the studies focus on time spent in congestion and traffic jams. But in reality, all time spent driving a car is just wasted time. We could do something else. In the U.S., it's an estimated seven work weeks of time spent just driving. Uh, so we'd like to get those seven weeks back, and we want to answer ourselves the question, if you had an extra seven weeks, what would you do with it? We also know that utilization is not good with cars. 96% of the time, they're doing nothing. So we have... 25 times as many cars as we need, and mostly they're just taking up space. In some cities, up to 20% of the land is just parking.
this is really, this brings us to a once in a generation opportunity to redefine our cities. It may be that individual car ownership is no longer a smart choice. We may not need all this parking infrastructure. We have opportunities for more green space to reinvent our public transit systems. So really it's a once in a generation opportunity to make these changes. Finally, we should not forget about the fact that it's not only people that need transport. Goods also need transport, and we also need uh, to take advantage of this opportunity given that the current system was tuned to have a human operator, and we don't need all those constraints anymore. Um, so with that, I'd like to move forward. So the topics of this session really are, how, what do we do to encourage this transformation? How do we get prepared for it? But also, how do we maximally take advantage of the opportunities uh, that self-driving cars and other vehicles will offer to us? So on that note, uh, I would like to turn it over to Dmitry Gorshkov to give us his thoughts on these topics. Go ahead, Dmitry. No sound, unfortunately, no sound coming. No sound coming from Dmitry. Well, Moscow is a, uh, a big car-centric city. The number of vehicles is on the rise every year. We are developing people uh, start asking for a better level of service for themselves. And as part of this development drive, We, uh, more than eight years ago, uh, in intellectual transport system uh, was set up. It's a huge uh, host uh, of all kinds of sensors, traffic lights, um, uh, cameras, etc. A huge uh, data centers, uh, databases. Moscow means over 4,000 different sensors and detectors that allow to identify vehicles and analyze traffic, uh, the distance between vehicles, the speed of the traffic flow, direction of traffic flow, and how the, we need to manage traffic in order to accommodate that. Um, over 16,000 intellectual traffic lights uh, that manage uh, flow, 180,000 cameras uh, that can track down uh, road accidents uh, and, and, and helping uh, traffic police, uh, 40, over 40,000 traffic lights. So Moscow is a huge city in this regard. Every day we have almost 300,000 vehicles uh, with GLONASS navigational system on the streets of and the roads of our city. The amount of data we're receiving daily is about 25 uh, terab terabytes. Um, that means 3,000 years of nonstop listening to uh, CD format music. So all this huge raft of data is being processed every day and is and is affecting the life of the city. We're keeping uh, track of the modern trends, uh, artificial intelligence developments. The 21st century, of course, is uh, uh, making inroads in our uh, notions of the speed of life, uh, quality of life. People want to get the services quick, uh, quickly, uh, in time. We uh, are learning from other cities uh, we uh, are, in, in other instances, we are paving the waves. Uh, we are trailblazing for ourselves and uh, our other, other colleagues. We, we uh, have several AI-based uh, projects running, uh, photo, video capturing over 3,000 units, uh, keeping a track of uh, road accidents, and preventing road accidents. It's improving road safety. It is also a, a traffic flow detecti detection uh, tool allowing us to analyze uh, traffic flow speed, direction. We have uh, AI 
monitoring of the river transport, we made a step forward uh, and we created uh, an artificial intelligence-based system to analyze our river transport. We want to develop uh, a river-based public transit system so that uh, city vi visitors and residents can use them. We are improving smart uh, intersection systems. Uh, all in all, uh, uh, there are numerous systems employed in this city now improving uh, light quality in this city. Uh, smart intersection, what does it mean? Uh, we did not discover America. We uh, followed best practices. Uh, taking stock of the best solutions offered by different cities and countries, and we uh, slightly adapting it to our needs. Each intersection, uh, a, a, an adaptive intersection, is equipped with a computer, uh, which on its own makes decisions on changing traffic lights. Uh, if there's no traffic coming uh, from a side road, then it will have a red light on if there are no pedestrians waiting, then red light on for pedestrians. So uh, the computer decides on prioritization. Originally, it was built as a, a priority tool for public uh, transit uh, uh, vehicles uh, because 80% of uh, the, the, re the residents use public transit uh, vehicles, but everybody benefits from it, because if there's no tram coming, no need for green light to be on. If there are no pedestrians, no need for them to cross. And um, uh, motorists have priority, they have green light on. So we, all these sensors, all the detectors and cameras, they uh, enable traffic lights to operate on their own. When we were uh, choosing for uh, the best options, Singapore, Sydney uh, offered the best solutions, we believe, because uh, those two cities are, are using uh, these technologies, uh, we created uh, overlapping uh, sensors uh, used as cameras and uh, transmitters. Uh, uh, Stockholm, Los Angeles, Helsinki, and many other major cities are using similar systems of traffic management. So what's the result uh, of uh, a reduction in time uh, spent at intersections, anywhere from 25 to 30 percent uh, improvement in road situation at each intersection. Next, uh, now we uh, there are over 2,000 cameras, digital cameras being uh, uh, employed by the city. Uh, they will be registering all road accidents. Uh, pedestrian uh, crossing at an improper place, uh, emergency situations, because traffic is important. It's all mathematics-based. Each lane has has a, a certain uh, throughput capacity depending on its width and the maximum speed limit. Any stop, uh, be it on the third ring road or the Moscow ring road, in one lane, uh, any breakdown in one lane would lead to a collapse of the whole road. So we need to uh, be able to analyze the unfolding events and respond quickly. We need to uh, maximize throughput capacity. So our current priority, we focus on the Moscow uh, road, MCAD. Uh, that's the road we want to focus on, and we want to bring down the uh, accident rate. Uh, Internet of Things, computer modeling, enabled us to create a digital version of any physical object, be it a book, a house, a space, a room, a car. In our case, it's a city. We are going to build a digital model of the city. My colleague, uh, who is in charge of this uh, interesting area, Alexander Polikov, he will speak uh, about it uh, in, in greater detail. One of the key priorities in general, one of the key goals of, uh, of, all, the, of all these activities is to uh, create uh, an Internet of Things. We want to have active infrastructure in the city. Pilotless cars is great. Cars are taking care of themselves. That's great. But cars need to uh, be in the loop. They need to be aware uh, when the traffic light is going to turn green or red, uh, where 
uh, there, there are traffic jams, uh, the congestion situation. Uh, we, once we have connectivity with pilotless cars, uh, this would lead to uh, lower traffic rate, uh, accident rate, and fatality rate. And finally, uh, Moscow uh, is moving uh, towards uh, mobility as a service very actively. We are developing uh, user services. We have an app. It's called Moscow Transport. This year, we uh, succeeded in, uh, in uh, we actually, we were awarded uh, uh, we received an award, ticketing award 2021 uh, in uh, mass uh, nomination. Uh, we beat Monaco and Nevada. Uh, the Monaco's app was awarded the prize last year. The international community uh, was very impressed with our approaches, intermodal approaches, because our app covers all modes of transportation. Any resident of the city uh, may use it now, uh, be it taxi, metro, car sharing, uh, buses, uh, bike sharing, uh, a push sharing. So a person using that app can build uh, a route, uh, can calculate all the fares that he would have to pay, can make all the payment uh, ahead of time. It can. Um, uh, book a car or any other service. So he would know that 20 meters from the metro exit, he will have a bike stand and he will be able to travel across the city. He will reach his point very quickly. He can choose the, the route uh, fast or picturesque or most interesting, most exciting. So different options are given to, uh, to him. So this was highly appreciated by the international uh, jury. Uh, more than two and a half million uh, downloads of this app, uh, more than uh, 600,000 active users every uh, month. And so more than 40 million routes have been built, uh, more than uh, 40 million. Uh, so this service has been used more than 40 million times uh, since its inception. That's it for me. Thank you. Dimitri, uh, I uh, certainly, from my experience developing self-driving cars, I know the the importance of data for that development. Um, I'm curious whether the city will use the data primarily for the city's planning, or might also share it with the self the companies developing the technology to help them uh, help them improve their progress. Uh, a, de a decision has been made in Moscow uh, to make uh, this data open, available to everybody else. So it's in public domain. There's a huge, uh, there's a huge, uh, huge mass of uh, data uh, that we receive from other authorities, uh, federal authorities, regional authorities. So uh, those who own data owns the world. Um, and so data, of course, uh, makes it possible for us to make forecasts for the future. Okay, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Greg Lindsay for his comments on the topic. Let's see. Can you hear us, Greg? Can you uh, go ahead? Yes, thank you, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be joining you all today here, albeit virtually, but thank you so much. It's a pleasure and honor to return to MOOC this year. Um, and yes, thank you for setting the stage, Jeff, and thank you. For, for laying out the stakes here, particularly to Moscow Const. Um, I'd like to do a bit of a provocation today, I guess, in discussing sort of the urban robotics revolution, um, which I would argue is going to arrive in many ways um, undetected, stealthily, in forms that we may not expect, not necessarily as self-driving cars or as urban air mobility, uh, but in much more modest means and uh, in inform factors that we may not necessarily anticipate at the start. So uh, here, of course, this is a, an image of, of, of the boring companies, you know, tunnels under Las Vegas uh, that supposedly will have, you know, autonomous Teslas drive through them. Um, I'm not so certain that's the future. The, the, the starting point for me in thinking about how we will be driven by robots or what will be driven by robots 
it goes back to a, a phrase that I heard seven years ago at the Googleplex in Mountain View. Uh, Astro Teller, who initiated the Google self-driving car program, which became Waymo, uh, gave a talk about sort of how we might think about how robotics would reshape cities. And he had this phrase that I, that I loved, uh, we might need self-driving buildings as well as self-driving cars. And then we realize, and Jeff, I would defer to you and others who are experts on this, but you know, when we think of autonomy, it's, it's not necessarily the vehicle factor. Autonomy is a set of capabilities, hardware and software, that like other technologies, will eventually come down in cost, will miniaturize, and can be applied to any number of applications, not just vehicles. And so I've been thinking about what happens when we have autonomous everything, autonomous stuff. Um, and so in this regard, we can already start to see various signs here and there. Prior to the pandemic in China, for example, there was an experiment called Mobimart. This was a self-driving store. Um, effectively, you would use your smartphone to unlock it, to enter and make purchases. The store itself could drive itself very slowly around the streets of Shanghai uh, and recharge overnight. But we can start to think about how real estate would become unmoored and begin to flow around cities. Uh, another experiment that I thought was really interesting, and this comes from a, a master plan community in Florida called, uh, um, oh, I forget, Babcock Ranch. Um, this was deployed using autonomous shuttles from Transloc, but here they were used to the effect to create an autonomous school bus for children uh, in which a half dozen children could join a teacher en route and, and effectively turn what was once a commute to school into a learning session. Um, so I thought this is interesting to think about classrooms effectively roaming around cities or communities. Uh, and Jeff, as you alluded to at the outset of the session, we've seen, of course, you know, the adoption of these devices, which started as experiments, began in earnest during the pandemic. So Neolix is one of the companies you referred to that's, that was here, again, in Shanghai uh, doing disinfectant spraying. I, I had the CEO on a, a, a webcast during the pandemic to talk about how they're deploying their technologies and their kind of partnerships. And here you can see, you know, a partnership with KFC to deliver just-in-time real chicken. But, you know, what Neelix is doing is actually operationalizing this discussion about, you know, rather than the classic laws of real estate of, you know, location, 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 how can you locate yourself where people will come to you? We can now start to deploy infrastructure to where the people are using, of course, data sets and sensors, of course, to understand where people are and then deploy. And so here you can sort of see their heat maps of, of chasing the crowd, as they put it. Um, they're not alone in this. You know, we're seeing, of course, around the world, various companies deploy this. This is Neuro, you know, another uh, form, founded by former Waymo engineers, their partnership with Domino's Pizza uh, to deploy self-driving pizza delivery in Houston, Texas. Uh, in the UK, of course, we've seen Starship, which is a, another urban robotics company using a much smaller form factor. There they've deployed using the sort of redways, the pedestrian pass, to imagine how they might deploy uh, robotics for grocery delivery and medicines during the pandemic as well. Um, and starting to think through about how do we share the road space or sidewalk space with these robots? How do we begin to incorporate them into our building typologies, into our actual sort of how they factor into the urban realm. And, and I, would, I would argue that things will get weirder uh, as we go along here. Here's, a, for example, a, an experiment with a self-driving garbage can, um, you know, imagining that we're going to have a streetscape that will be filled with seemingly autonomous objects, as I mentioned, um, falling around particular objects that we will have to share road space with and share sidewalk space with. And I think these objects will be, quickly become more fantastical and less like vehicles than we might expect. So this is an image uh, New Yorkers will know in New York when they're when workers are disputing with their with their labor uh, with, their, with their employers they deploy this inflatable rat and I saw this one day thinking about the fact that it was in a truck bed um, we might soon see you know architectural objects advertisements all sorts of autonomous things moving throughout the cityscape. And I thought this was a particularly resonant image, given that uh, Robin Chase, the founder of Zipcar, one of the you know, great thinkers about uh, shared mobility, uh, has already come up with the acronym RATS for Retail Autonomous Traffic Services as a catch-all term for what we might expect these to be. So hopefully RATS will soon enter the lexicon. And, you know, and obviously the pandemic, of course, was fueled to the fire behind all of this. You know, this massive shift in our, in our behaviors, uh, the changes away from high street retail to fueling online grocery shopping and delivery, and of course, meal delivery, um, this, you know, huge profusion. We talk about 15-minute cities uh, in Paris, in, in, in Rome, in Milan, et cetera, but the companies that were actually building 15-minute cities were companies like Amazon and Baidu and Yandex and others that were deploying delivery, delivery within 15 minutes or less. So, for example, this is a this is a Matt Newberg. He runs a newsletter called Hungry. Uh, early in the pandemic, he went undercover as a driver for Amazon's new uh, new grocery service that opened in Los Angeles. And there, he discovered that yes, that basically Amazon was was basically deploying 
uh, new stores within 15 minute delivery of affluent Los, Los Angelinos. And effectively the stores were warehouses first. They were reconfiguring the layouts in almost real time based on the data from deliveries. So, you know, new kinds of urban infrastructure, new ways of retailing are following this urban robotics revolution as well. And it's deploying closer and closer to the edge. When we think about, you know, warehousing logistics, we of course think of massive warehouses on the periphery of our cities. But during the last 18 months, we've seen this revolution where robotics companies like Fabric here from Israel uh, are partnering with large delivery chains and others to basically Walmart, uh, Instacart is under consideration in the States, to basically deploy these micro fulfillment centers into interstitial spaces around our cities, including even vacant storefronts. So we're seeing you know, the urban robotics revolution is not just in the delivery vehicles, but also in these you know, stealth warehouses that are appearing around our cities. And you know, it'll be interesting to see to what extent we can start to automate the buildings themselves, coming back to Astro Teller's uh, original statement. Uh, again, in the United States, Reef Technology has more than a billion dollars of investment from SoftBank. They've purchased more than 4,000 uh, parking lots around the United States. Um, and they've deployed what looks like shipping containers to you know, do meals and, and vaccinations and other things. But my friend Brian Boyer at the University of Michigan has pointed out that what Reef is really doing is deploying what might be called a, a minimum viable building, right? It's disassembling the components of buildings into the shipping containers and other uses. Can we automate those as well? Can we do going back to the Moby Mart? Can we start to think about what autonomous stores might look like deploying to these, to these neighborhoods? And again, these are not just sort of theoretical uh, experiments. You know, one of the things that I've been paying most closely attention to is autonomous micromobility. Rather than hailing a car that comes to you, how can we start to rethink the streetscape if we can have, in fact, autonomous scooters as SPIN is beginning to deploy in the United States? This is in partnership with the robotics firm Tortoise. So they've already begun to think about, you know, what if we can actually have, you know, scooters rearrange themselves at night where we can, you know, collect urban forms of infrastructure to decongest our, our cities and sidewalks in various ways. And how do we start to think about these at scale as well? You know, here you can see, uh, what should we call it when we have, you know, uh, large numbers of micromobility other forms on our streetscapes? Is this, is this a flock of scooters, a scrum of scooters? Um, you know, what happens to our movement patterns and, and, uh, and begin to thinking through this infrastructure when that happens? So cities have already begun to grapple with this, uh, you know, of course, how we might regulate this cityscape full of autonomous objects. Uh, Los Angeles, of course, you know, famously deployed its mobility data specification to rein in scooters, the ability to both receive data and also send instructions. And that ability will become more important when autonomous objects are on the streetscape. Um, Los Angeles has also flirted with unsuccessfully uh, trying to basically be able to push instructions into the various mapping services, Waze and Google Maps and others uh, around various cities. And it'll be interesting to sort of see again who, who controls the map, controls the territory there when it comes to the deployment of this. But not, we might also have to think about, you know, new technologies, of course, about, you know, congestion tolling and other things that can automatically update who is allowed to access which part of the roads. And this is a startup uh, out of the U.S. called Clearroad uh, that I've worked with. They, they basically use GPS-based mileage-based or kilometer-based tolling services, first for autonomous vehicles. But here we can start to think about, you know, how we might do this for autonomous scooters or urban robotics, uh, how we might use code to limit which parts of the sidewalk or street they might use and what price they might pay to do that. So to conclude quickly, I, I worked on a project uh, several years ago with uh, my colleagues, Brian Boyer and Anthony Townsend, then with the National League of Cities and the Bloomberg Philanthropies to think through several scenarios of what uh, urban robotics might mean. And, this to harken back to Cedric Price, you know, technology is the answer, what is the question? We wanted to ask several questions about how might we harness these technologies to solve certain policy problems. So one, for example, we started with the notion of, you know, how can we use autonomous vehicles to increase the mobility of, of senior citizens and the disabled? To think about, you know, I'll, I'll go through these quickly, of course, but, you know, how can we start to think about, you know, using uh, the taxes generated by these autonomous toll roads or, you know, or uh, other kinds of congestion pricing to basically create a, a service specialized for these elderly citizens. And so instead of an autonomous school bus, we might have an autonomous shuttle with caregivers instead of drivers and therefore increase the mobility and access of that population. We started to think about what would be the impacts of urban, urban delivery on workforces. Of course, automation is, of course, a, a, a giant fear that it may destroy jobs in cities across the world. So we started to think about, you know, number one, how could we ensure that these autonomous robots were not clogging up the streetscape, uh, you know, driving people off of sidewalks? 
And second, could we create a new class of workers? Uh, you know, instead of drivers, could they be the people who take charge of delivery? Uh, we called them porters. We imagined that every neighborhood, every office building, every multifamily apartment might have someone who is in fact a, a concierge who might interact with the robots to sort those packages and ensure they get on their way. Um, we fleshed out a scenario thinking through about the implications of, you know, the autonomous scooter. Um, what if you could step outside your home and have a fleet of urban robotics, perhaps provided by the private sector or even public, uh, that would allow you to choose the vehicle type that you needed for that particular moment? And this, of course, has been a dream for literally decades of Bill Mitchell at MIT and others, that rather than having a car, a two-ton device uh, that we use for everything, what if we could finally have exactly the device we need at that particular moment, which could deploy itself to you. Um, and then finally, we thought about you know, the implications of this for buses, and this is where I'll, I'll hand off to my panelists in a moment here too, is that you know, not just, of course, autonomous cars or, or shuttles, but could we start to think about how bus rapid transit and other high capacity street-based systems could be transformed by autonomous vehicles? So smoother rides, uh, higher capacity throughput, Imagine that the, the systems could separate themselves, the urban periphery to sort themselves out. These are also all possible with autonomous systems as we begin to think about how we can massage the throughput of our cities. So with that, thank you so much, Jeff. I appreciate uh, your having me and everyone's having me here today. Great, thank you, Greg. It's, uh, it's, it's amazing to see such a wide array of possible uses of autonomy. Um, we know that many of these are in the early stages, some of them still research projects, some of them having small deployments. And uh, I think on, on that note, uh, I'd like to turn to Mr. Polykoff. I know that your institute also has launched a, uh, a small number of autonomous vehicles. And I wonder if you could comment on scale uh, deployment of such vehicles. I would like to continue and to follow the colleague. Um, and there are some things uh, I would like to dispute. If you say that revolution um, happens invisibly, but it's not so. As a scientist, I can tell you that uh, 30 years uh, we've been working on that. Uh, and now we use things uh, that we had 100 years ago. Revolution already took place. For example, 100 years ago at Tomsk University, they started the first uh, hyperloop. It was a uh, cargo rail Mm, truck uh, that uh, uh, was driving slowly, but still the technology was there. Hyperloop One made uh, the first project, the uh, Huntun Zarubina, using the same technology. The revolution took place many years ago. Now people recall that actually the revolution was a long time ago. So now speaking about the unmanned vehicles, I'd like to tell you the following. First and foremost, I would like to speak about safety. Of course, you touched uh, upon an important topic. 46% of accidents happen because uh, uh, of uh, the drivers, because they violate the traffic rules, um, or if it happens so that uh, the drivers uh, drink and drive. 54% uh, account for highway accidents, uh, accidents in the courtyards, accidents with trucks, and so on. According to various expert surveys, um, the number of accidents uh, can uh, be decreased uh, by 70 to 90 percent. But everyone is speaking about vision zero, and I think that without an uh, unmanned vehicle, it's not possible to go to vision zero. If we want to have zero fatality rate on the roads, we need to introduce new technologies, and we need to use unmanned vehicles. There is no way around. Right now, I would like to tell you about our projects here in Moscow. We do have um, unmanned vehicles um, here in Moscow. I'd like to tell you about uh, the means of transportation used uh, in our institution, developed together with my colleagues. Um, the first is uh, Parkon. It's the kind of a car which uh, checks um, that uh, the users uh, use the parking properly, pay for it, uh, and uh, observe uh, the parking rules. Um, 
they check if uh, the car stopped uh, in the right place. Uh, so a camera is embedded here. So on the left, you can see Parkon. It drives in Basmani district of Moscow. It controls over 1,000 cars. It started in February 2020. And frankly speaking, at the beginning, we were a little bit afraid. What do I mean when I say we were afraid? I mean that before we let it go on the streets, um, we worked together with uh, my colleagues uh, from Moscow Institute. Um, we were just running to the road and we were checking if the car would stop. We tried it. The developers ran to the road and uh, it stopped them. So it really uh, drives uh, uh, smoothly. It follows uh, the traffic rules. Uh, it worked for two winters. Uh, and uh, it's working for the second summer. No matter what the weather is, uh, it drives uh, smoothly. The basis of the driving, the uh, digital twin of uh, the map, um, and uh, my colleague already said that who owns uh, and who controls the map, um, that person controls the territory. I agree with you. There are, for example, um, marks uh, on the roads, uh, but uh, they will disappear. The car will know on center of uh, uh, traffic organization or other state authorities should determine that uh, today we are going to have only two places for parking here and the price for parking is this and that. So everything will be in the form of a service. Of course, I'm, I'm uh, thinking about the future now. And we decided to make one step ahead. During the time of pandemics, uh, we came up with an idea to make an unmanned car which um, brings um, uh, the COVID tests um, of, to a laboratory. You know that uh, um, medical professionals uh, collect uh, uh, the analysis uh, and um, uh, there are um, such workers who simply collect uh, the tests and then have to bring them to the laboratory. There are a lot of patients uh, nowadays, you know, uh, and uh, doctors, of course, are superheroes in the time of pandemics. Uh, they bring a lot of uh, work on their shoulders. And so we came up with an idea to collect uh, tests, to collect analysis and uh, to bring them to the laboratories to to avoid uh, contacts with people to ensure better safety. You demonstrated uh, the situation in uh, uh, the US. Uh, it's called uh, Ford uh, Fusion. In Russia, it's called Ford Mondeo. We also started to use Ford for as an unmanned vehicle. Now we use Lada Vesta. And recently, it's, uh, it took the second place in the world uh, as uh, rare cars uh, used uh, on the roads. Uh, it's an international recognition. The International Automobile Agency said that uh, that is uh, the second uh, rare car in the world which can be used as an unmanned vehicle. And Lada Vesta is now driving around hospitals. Uh, it, uh, on the regular basis, uh, it collects uh, analysis, so it collects uh, samples, tests, and, and brings them to laboratories. The Lada has uh, already transported more than 4,000 containers with tests. We make the life of medical professionals easier. It's not a pilot project, and I'm saying so because a pilot project is something that happens for two months, for example, and this car has been working for more than four months. So that is a nice case. And um, there are cases uh, of using unmanned vehicles for social purposes, even here in Moscow. Right, so everything is uh, based on communication as well. My colleague was absolutely right to say that transportation now is all about communication. When people, children in the future use unmanned vehicles, they will pay more attention to communication. Uh, you showed us a case uh, where children communicate uh, with teacher on the during driving. And uh, same with other groups of population. Thank you much for those comments. It's, uh, it's great to see the progress and the plans to expand the, the, the launch for this. Um, on that note, uh, I'd like to turn to Mr. Zanay Daroff uh, and comment that KPMG has an autonomous transport readiness index and they recently placed Moscow at 26th, and, and previously they were at 22nd. And so, you know, I think it uh, brings the obvious question. Uh, can you comment on how Moscow is doing overall in its readiness and promotion of, of, of these autonomous vehicles? Go ahead. 
Jeff, thank you very much. Um, I would say not only Moscow, but Russia as a whole. So let's uh, speak um, step by step. If uh, we speak about the development of uh, unmanned vehicles, uh, autonomous vehicles in Russia, it all started back in 2017. We already have specific solutions. And uh, I'd like to uh, speak about 2018. There are three uh, key moments here. Uh, and. Uh, TI Aftonet roadmap was approved. It was the basis for the development of autonomous mobility. And uh, we started to work in Skolkova and Innopolis when we were driving short distances without uh, drivers. And in 2018, there was a decree of the government uh, to use unmanned vehicles uh, on the roads. And these are the vehicles without drivers. In 2019, we organized a technological competition upgrade uh, the winter city, and we found out that uh, the car behaved uh, properly in uh, winter conditions. Um, and uh, a lot of interesting and exciting moments we found out. And in 2020, there, there were two interesting players, um, Spare After Tech and Yandex uh, Taxi decided to have um, a separate area of focus, um, autonomous cars. Um, and in 2021, uh, there were three main uh, uh, drivers. Um, the set of activities on testing and uh, introduction of uh, um, unmanned uh, vehicles on the roads um, was um, approved. Um, and then we became a member of the convention. Uh, the U.S. Uh, has not ratified um, this convention. Everything happens uh, faster, but we have ratified it. And uh, in 2021, the plan was uh, uh, approved uh, to launch um, a pilot uh, project of uh, autonomous car in Russia. Yandex, for example, drove uh, 13 million kilometers without uh, drivers. Uh, and it made 17,000 of uh, drives um, and 170 autonomous cars are used. And I think that we can compare Yandex with the largest players of the world. At Skolkova, as I told you, we started to deal with it in 2017. We have three main stages. Um, first, uh, the testing at the uh, testing polygon. Second, uh, the use at the territory of uh, Skolkova. And the third stage, uh, the, uh, the use of such autonomous cars at Skolkova without drives. Um, so in 2021, it was decided that amendments can be made to, to the legislation of Russia so that uh, it uh, becomes easier to uh, launch pilot projects um, and uh, to give uh, the controls uh, to the robot completely. We gave uh, 11 uh, permissions uh, to test uh, autonomous cars at Skolkova facilities. Here you can see our testing uh, roads um, at uh, Skolkova. The whole territory is used for that, actually. We tried to have a look what happens in Russia and actually in Russia we have quite a lot of technological teams. They are developing various technologies, um, deliveries, um, transportation of people, taxis, um, module system, the use of uh, new technologies built from scratch and the technologies uh, uh, which are embedded in already existing uh, cars. Um, uh, Alexander already spoke uh, about uh, Mm, about it. Here you can see a poster line. It's a commercial car developed uh, by a small company and it demonstrates uh, really great results uh, from the point of view of technological readiness. Um, all the cars I've shown to you can be divided into different types. Um, so cars built uh, on regular cars uh, and cars built uh, from scratch, uh, like cargo trucks uh, um, that are autonomous, uh, that are used for logistics tasks, uh, uh, or platforms that are created by Spare Bank, for example. It's an autonomous car which uh, doesn't have a, a wheel and it's already the fifth stage of automation. And you can divide the cars according to the methods. Uh, it's, it's, it can be a comprehensive solution when uh, you use uh, various uh, data, um, visual data, GNSS, and so on. And uh, cars like uh, Tesla, for example, Elon Musk uh, uh, refuses uh, LIDAR and says that you can resolve all the problems with the help of stereo cameras and sensors. Well, my personal opinion is uh, 
that the question of uh, autonomous uh, vehicle development without leader is limited because the difficult uh, intersections uh, it becomes uh, difficult um, and the, the navigation cannot help you to resolve a comprehensive problem. I believe that uh, the question is all about uh, the integration of various sensors and systems that work all together. And you demonstrated a video from Philadelphia and cars are equipped with the uh, LIDAR and everything else. And people doubt about LIDARs uh, because they cost a lot. But we know that uh, all the technological things um, become cheaper and the LIDARs will be cheaper too. So at the beginning, they cost about $7,000. Now it costs about uh, $500. And in 2025, it will cost about $100. It will not have a significant influence on the price of the car. And that is the dynamics uh, uh, we had uh, with the batteries uh, for electric cars. Uh, there we can also see the decrease of price. Uh, and in the future, electric cars uh, will cost uh, the same as the cars with the internal um, combustion engine. And the most important thing, why are we doing it all? It leads uh, to lower fertility rate uh, uh, on the streets. In 2017, we started to use various autonomous cars in the facilities of Skolkova, and uh, we had uh, no traffic accidents. And they had uh, dozens of accidents uh, with uh, cars uh, driven by people, but unmanned cars didn't have any traffic accidents. And there were some funny accidents when there were conflicts between drivers and robots, and drivers uh, couldn't understand uh, why the uh, car was uh, driving precisely uh, according to the traffic rules, and there were conflicts between people, so drivers uh, and uh, robots. That was funny. And it's convenient because it gives you time to do what you want. Uh, and Jeff was right to say that time is uh, the biggest and the most precious thing. We spend a lot of time just uh, driving, and usually we spend this time simply in uh, traffic jams. And then uh, you can uh, make a parking space uh, free and uh, it uh, creates uh, better accessibility for people with uh, limited abilities. And here I would like to show you two scenarios in the future, ride sharing and Tesla network, um, when you buy a car and you share it with other people. So autonomous uh, transportation is really the future of our industry, and I hope that uh, it will come faster than we think. Thank you. It's uh, it's very important to understand the the large cost involved uh, in the vehicles themselves, but also the effort, as we've heard from you and the previous speakers, just the effort by a broad array of people across government and industry to pull all this all this together and to make this actually work. So, given the scale of what's needed here, uh, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Kirsten Heineke. Uh, and ask him what impact the pandemic has had on the, on the progress overall and people's attitudes towards the prospects for, uh, for self-driving vehicles. Uh, Kirsten, can you, can you hear us? Would you like to go ahead? Yeah, I can hear you well and thank you and happy to go ahead. Um, so first of all, a pleasure to be here. Sorry I couldn't join you in person. Um, basically, I think, Jeff, you, you made the point earlier. Um, we very much share, share this notion that we're somewhere in the middle of this, uh, what we call mobility second inflection point, but basically the big, big revolution where uh, instead of like in the beginning of the 1900s when we switched from horses to cars or when our forefathers switched from horses to cars, this time we're going to do a similar switch, but it's not going to be from one thing to one specific other thing, but it's go uh, instead it's going to be us switching from using um, a car for everything that we do to get from A to B. So mobility meaning I get into my car and I go to my destination to I pick the quote unquote best possible option for every single journey that I do. And that best possible option might well include and will for sure include autonomous vehicles to a certain extent, but it will also include multimodality and many, many other shapes and forms of transport, some of which we have seen today. And uh, coming back to your question on the pandemic, I think the pandemic has only accelerated many of these shifts. Um, when we talk about uh, mobility demand, when we talk about mobility patterns, I think one big thing that we're seeing is that consistently people like to use bicycles and other forms of micromobility more and more compared to pre-pandemic. Um, but at the same time, we also see that some of the technology development has accelerated, especially when we think about autonomous transport for goods, 
due to uh, the requirement to pass on parcels and many other things without contact and do contactless delivery. But then we also do see that autonomous driving is still accelerating and is sort of uh, coming up a bit further in the hype cycle. Um, when we think about this, this sort of future of mobility in a broader sense, we do believe that autonomous driving is for sure one of the key elements here. It's definitely um, uh, one out of those technologies that are enabling this. And we do believe it's actually going to be the most massive disruption and the most massive disruptive element. For sure, electrification makes our vehicles green, um, but it, it doesn't necessarily change congestion. And it also doesn't necessarily change how we actually get from A to B and how we, how, what our relationship is towards owning a vehicle versus sharing a vehicle. And therefore, we, we are extremely happy that at the moment there is lots of activities ongoing and many companies are making great progress. This is obviously a bit um, a bit of an outside in view, so some of the companies might see this differently. But we do see many companies that have made strong announcements and actually launching autonomous vehicles extremely quickly. Um, and then and, and this is maybe a bit more data-driven analysis, uh, right? So uh, we do believe that this is going to be massive, right? So what you do see here is basically an overview of some global scenarios um, of cities where we believe autonomous vehicles are going to be launched when. And then you also see a bit how this is going to impact the way how we get from A to B in those cities. So if you do take a look at, um, at for example, the central column for Europe, we do, we do believe that the modal mix, so the way how we move about, especially in cities, is going to be changed quite dramatically. And if you look at these uh, columns in the center for Europe, you see two blue uh, buckets on top of those columns. And you will see that they're actually quite massive when it comes to total share of the modal mix. And that ultimately, and that's why I'm saying we have this mobility revolution, the personal vehicle is going to be one of the main devices that is going to quote unquote suffer from this and be reduced when it comes to the number of miles traveled and the number of, of trips made uh, with it. Um, I think our key message here is we, we don't know what the future is going to be. And if we look at, uh, if we look further out towards 2035 and 2040, right, and think about what is going to be the, um, the mobility scenario and, and what are our cities going to look like? We have um, created these four bookend scenarios, right? And, and these four bookend scenarios look at different, different parts of or different, different methodologies, how we do address the mobility challenge of today. And they also do look at how many miles we're actually going to travel. And when we talk about autonomous vehicles, in our mind, this is, uh, needs to be part of our technology revolution in order for us to be able to meet climate change goals, but at the same time also be able to stay as mobile as possible or maybe in some cities even grow our mobility. Because we, we do believe that while for sure um, uh, battery electric vehicles are going to alleviate a lot of the pain when it comes to um, uh, emissions, we still have a problem on congestion. And to solve that congestion problem, we need technology and autonomous vehicles are going to be a big, a big, big part of this. Um, when, we, when we think about how this is going to happen over time, right, and how the, uh, the revenue pools and the value pools behind are going to be redistributed, you can see a couple of things. So one is we, we strongly do believe that um, everything that is a, a robo taxi, a robo shuttle will be a massive value pool by the time we get to 2030. We also do believe that some of the other uh, uh, parts of the value chain and parts of the ecosystem are going to decline a bit, uh, obviously because some of this will be cannibalized. But on the other hand, autonomous vehicles, autonomous shuttles might also well stimulate a bit further the, the amount of uh, miles driven and thus the revenue pools. And then, uh, and I know this is fairly granular, but basically if we look at this and if we do take a look at um, uh, how this is going to split out, right, and who is actually going to be making the money, quote unquote, we do believe that most of the, of the value that is being generated will actually be one in the technology of the vehicle. Uh, it will also be a lot in, in making sure that you're able to properly insure the vehicle and control the vehicle. And then there are some further pools to be addressed in maintenance, but ultimately the biggest bucket is going to come from whoever is owning the customer relationship and whoever is owning the mobility platform and is basically hosting these autonomous mobility services. And that will be, in our mind, a fairly attractive business. Not only that part, but the entire value chain is going to create tremendous opportunity for, for many folks. That's it for me. Thank you very much for having me and looking forward to any questions.
Great, thank you very much, Kirsten. That was very, very exciting to see the the change in thinking as we as we go through this process of developing this technology. Um, we have a few minutes for questions left, and so I actually want to come back to the talk that Carol gave earlier. Uh, he mentioned his opinion on lidar and that he felt it was very important, and so I want to ask him the same question about vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication and vehicle-to-infrastructure communication. We know that this will help make the problem easier, but my question to you is, is it just something that will help so we work on it, or is it so critical that we should insist that vehicles cannot be on the road autonomously unless these technologies are in place to help them out? Uh, I wonder if, uh, Carol, if you have some comments on that. Uh, thank you. It's a uh, comprehensive question, and it would require a lot of testing. My personal idea is that we need to develop uh, both vehicle technologies, uh, but also infrastructure. Of course, uh, V2X uh, technologies would make it easier to operate cars, and they're beautiful cars. Uh, based uh, on the uh, idea that traffic lights would inform them so they they don't equip their cars with uh, cameras detecting the traffic lights assuming that traffic lights will inform them themselves so but it's a great technology thank you, thank you very much for those for those comments um, one of the things I want to ask now, I, and, and I think I'll be addressing this to both uh, uh, Dimitri and Alexander for their, for their comments. Uh, you know, we've advertised this idea that people will not need to own a personal car anymore. Uh, and, and so my question is, uh, is that realistic at all? Could we get to zero personal car ownership, say, in a city like Moscow? Uh, and if so, what would the timeline look like? How, how, how long would that take us? Um, uh, I, I don't know if, uh, Alexander, if you want to uh, answer first, and then maybe I'll get some from Dimitri as well. Uh, <clears throat> uh, it's a clear question, and there is an answer to it. Uh, can we uh, get rid and abandon horse-driven carts? even uh, when it comes to teaching uh, children um, equestrian sport. No, because some people like it, uh, they can afford it. It would be very expensive to have an, 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 a non-connected vehicle. So each vehicle, they're connected already now because we are you know, compiling navigational data. So all cars and are connected and they're connected to the infrastructure and uh, Already now, cars can detect the uh, forthcoming uh, traffic light. So there is connection. Can we use, yes, racing, uh, in racing, they will use unconnected cars, but they will be very expensive. It's just like Arabian um, horses, very expensive. I would also disagree. I think it's 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 going to take uh, many years uh, until we can reach the zero uh, personal car ownership level in Moscow or any other countries. Uh, I own a a, a, a a motorbike, and I don't see myself without a motorbike. So I would say no. My answer is no. Many years. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, at this point, what I'd like to do is uh, thank all the speakers, uh, both here in person and online, for, for their comments. Uh, I'd also like to uh, thank the Moscow Urban Forum for organizing this session and inviting all of us here. Uh, and so with that, we'll wrap up. And uh, I'll say, Das Vidanya. <laughs>